Welcome to the Tapestry of Life. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's topic is Prevention Point Philadelphia. Prevention Point Philadelphia is a public health organization serving the most vulnerable high-risk populations, such as the homeless, sex workers, injection drug users. Prevention Point with over 7,000 individuals they serve every year. Founded in 1991 as an underground syringe exchange organization, it has developed into a multi-service public health agency focusing on individuals on the fringe of our mainstream services. They truly are a bridge uh, uh, to various support services that help people transform their lives. To discuss today's topics, I want to welcome back my co-host, uh, Rick Ford, and my two special guests, Sam Morales and Nadia Flores. Got that right, didn't I? Yes. yes. I also want to congratulate uh, Rick Ford, who just was appointed as Commissioner of uh, Parks and Rec, who's now Commissioner mm -hmm. Rick Ford. <laughs> commissioner. Yes. Yeah. Mr. So Ford. Congratulations yeah. to you. Thanks again, Pat. Uh, uh, Sam, maybe you could start out by telling us a little bit about the program. Well, Prevention Point was uh, established uh, through uh, Act of Philadelphia. A bunch of uh, activists got together. It was a need for prevention and harm reduction in our community. Um, uh, it was at that time, it was like in the 80s, uh, it was a high risk of HIV, um, um, different diseases, um, so they, um, the activists got together, we protested, and we got syringes, and we started working in the community, and that's how we started. Yeah. That was a very, if I remember correctly, yeah. I, at the time I was involved with running one of the methadone maintenance right. programs in the mm -hmm. city, and I know it was a very controversial thought that it was, be giving yes. out syringes mm -hmm. uh, to uh, primarily, you know, IV drug users. Mm -hmm. Well, the concept, what the most people were saying that we, we was, uh, um, pushing pe drugs on people and it yeah. was not it was not that it was the point is is harm reduction and prevention because most of the service wasn't really working this is the only one that we we figured that it was needed in the community for it was a high risk of uh, drugs uh injected drug users at that time um the the in in the 80s when the hiv came out uh, they didn't need to come out with something because they, we knew, the activists knew that uh, by them sharing needles, not only through sex, but also needles, um, it was affecting a lot, especially in our community. Um, in North Philadelphia, that, that district alone, it was called the East Coast. Yeah. And um, so when I say the East Coast, I say you can come down there, you can get two or three kilos or whatever you need at that time. Um, so it was like and a kilo uh, just for I, mean, I don't know a I, kilo I mean, we all understand it, yeah two point a two point five two point two depends pounds of uh, coke, uh, cocaine okay. um, that was um, that's what you call kilo yeah yeah was the East Coast everybody was coming from West Philly Jersey Camden uh, from all over New York everything we had a lot of stuff there um, that's why the stood the neighborhood stood. Uh, and still, it's a high risk of uh, drug users. It's still there. It had been there for 40, 50 years now. Back in the 80s, during the, in that era, mm -hmm. the, the, the percentage of heroin was mm -hmm. high. It was yes. almost equated to almost 98, 99% yeah. mm -hmm. pure heroin yes. back then mm -hmm. uh, in the 25th district. And uh, that brought on an onslaught of folks coming into Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, we got to remember back in the days the heroin was was heroin. Um, oh, back wow. in the days, uh, cocaine was free base. Yeah. Um, back in the days, you know, we have uh, the names are uh, marijuana was uh, uh, Panama Red, Apopoca Gold, Chiva Chiva. Mm -hmm. So we knew exactly what we was getting. Mm -hmm. The heroin was the same way too. Um, because um, heroin is a kind of chemical that if you cut it, it only lasts like 72 hours. You gotta sell it real fast. So the, the so at that time, heroin bag of dope would cost you like a dollar fifty two dollars a bag of dope. It was six packs, half a bundles and bundles. It's not like now ten dollar bag or 
twenty dollar bag. What would you say the percentage of uh, heroin today is not ninety percent anymore? So it's cut with a lot of other things now. Well, be honest with you, it's cut so much um, because um, they want to stretch it and last longer, um, okay. and, and they want to get people think they're getting high on heroin, but really there's so many chemicals um, mixed in with mixed it. into yeah. it um, that as really the most it, it don't even, I don't see some people with a with a scratch back in the day she used to have scratch and it's, all they see is like nodding on the corner I understand that uh, but it's not I know it's not cut with quinine like back in the days uh, it's it might be it might not but that you know I just quinine I, used to be a common cut yes it was common point, cut yes in yeah earlier in India yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and the, the it all depends on the neighborhoods that you go to um, but I know the heroin in our neighborhoods is real good, um, regardless what they cut it with. Um, um, but it's not, I don't think it's really, it could be synthetic. I, I don't know. Yeah. If I, I haven't. Uh, you know, it's interesting you say, not to digress for, but for mm -hmm. a moment, uh, you can almost tell where the dope came from because mm -hmm. it was. There were certain things like Talwin and Benadryls in right. certain neighborhoods. Yeah. And, and, and South Philly you know, South Philly yeah. and meth yeah. methamphetamine was downtown in South Philly. Yeah, so you actually, by looking at, which I, I think a lot of people in the audience don't appreciate, is that you used to be able to look at the dope and right. ask, find out what it, where it was and know where they yeah. were coming yeah. from, right. what part yeah. of the city. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You yeah. actually yeah. know. Yeah. It's just kind of yeah. it. Now, I don't know if that's the case today. I don't think so. Nah, nah. Much. Well, then now they got you know they everybody's duplicating. They put stamps yeah. on it. And they might put the happy girl. They might put the happy man. But it's the same though, yeah. you know. But but you know, going back to that, it's even funny you mention that because South Philly was known for yeah. uh, what they call pancakes and syrup. Yeah. Pancakes yeah. and syrup. Right. Yeah. Now right. PCP right. is kind of centralized, like a little bit in North Philly now. Yeah. Right. And that's where folks that smoke PCP they're going in North Philly. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. that, that, that whole geographical thing is really interesting. Folks yeah. that really wanted to get good dope, uh, heroin, they went to the Badlands. Bad Bad Lands. Lands. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is the 24th, 25th, the, the yeah. district down around right. Kensington, yeah. Frankfurt, that area yeah. of the city, for those who might yeah. not know. Right. When you say district, you're talking about police district. I Indeed, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. So, so then let's talk a little bit about, you, you talked about the inception of a prevention point mm -hmm. and how it really was a, uh, put down there mm -hmm. centrally in the 24th and 25th district. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about Operation Sunrise back then, I'm quite right. sure we all know about that. Yes. That was a program designed with law enforcement and the police and right. so on to kind of de-escalate some of the drug activity. And more than anything else, um, the city put individuals down there to help put individuals in treatment mm -hmm. besides locking up the drug dealers and so forth. So. Right. That was an interesting moment there at the, in the 24th and 25th district yeah. when Operation Sunrise. Mm -hmm. And that's where I kind of felt it, found out about this whole prevention point thing mm -hmm. in Needle Park. So let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that and the work that you guys are doing down there. And you mentioned earlier how society thought that you were pushing drugs on people, right. and but you were really trying to cut down the, the risk, mm -hmm. uh, harm reduction, and right. most of all, uh, the HIV uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you got to look at the fact, um, and, and it might be, it depends how you look at the situation behind the fact. Back in the days when, when the, the, in political, they, was, they said they was cleaning up the neighborhoods, uh, providing service for people. But there wasn't mean people where they at as far as, as, as the accurate service they needed. Um, because in those days when we was getting, when I was getting hired, the only time my friends come around with that is called those stick up or this stick up means grab a gun and stick in somebody's face and take their money or s go in the corner get a, a half a uh, half a pound and sell it um, nickel bags uh, it was a fast hustle back in the days it was an easy hustle because uh, most of the neighborhoods the our community we got to understand that we were poor um, you know, um, there was hardly no kind of uh, work. Um, um, the, uh, it was hard for welfare. It was enough making it. So yeah. at that time, the only solution that our neighborhood had was solid drugs. Um, mm -hmm. So we got caught up in the game. We can talk a little bit about the experience of mm -hmm. what it was like uh, growing up and living in that community. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can transition to mm -hmm. Nadia. Nadia. 
I got it right now. Nydia. Nydia. Yeah. I'm sorry. Say it again. Nydia. <laughs> Nydia. Nydia. Yeah. Okay. So when when he talks about the '80s in a certain way and about his experience with it, uh, what was going on for you at that time? Well, in the '80s, I was not doing nothing yet. I was just smoking weed, popping pills. I did um, syrup on 17th and Jefferson. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, well, historically known location. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So they had, and it wasn't cut, it was p pure uh, snack. And syrup is, yellow. for the people out there that don't know. Tussin X. Uh, Robitussin. Robitussin. Yeah. yeah. Well, not Robitussin, but, well, it's me, you, you know. know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a codeine based, I think it's, it's a codeine based, right. uh, which is in the uh, opiate family. Yeah. yeah. Right. Codeine. Yeah. Now you mentioned the progression, okay. weed, pills, yeah, syrup. Yeah, gateway was the weed, pills, syrup. And the, then that's the down high, so that's what I always liked. Yeah. So I met a guy, and that's how he introduced me to heroin, which is the ultimate down high. And then you started off snorting heroin. Snorting heroin. Okay. Yeah, I started snorting heroin. And then, um, like, it wasn't mm. um, lasting long enough. Your body builds a tolerance. Met another guy, and he introduced me into banging heroin, which is injecting IV using. You took a risk with that. The yeah. I what took a what risk made with you it. say, you know what, the snorting isn't working anymore? Your body, you're sick. Yeah. The tolerance is no longer. You know, you have to snort like eight bags. You know, it's to get I don't high have that. I don't yeah. have eighty dollars. Wow. You know what I mean? So if I can shoot two bags or three or four bags, that'll hold me faster. That's instant high. Like, you're going to feel it like one, two, three, you feel it. You know, and when you're so sick, you do things that you don't think of doing it. You just do it. Yeah. Now, to walk us through that first time you injected mm. that needle. No, well, the first time I injected, I didn't know how to inject. Um, I was sick. And I was outside, and I was walking around, and I met this guy, and the guy didn't want to do it outside. He said, you got a spot? I had the spot. So he had the drugs. So I took him in my house, and I'm thinking, you know, he's going to give me some to snort. So when I see him putting everything in the cooker, a cooker is something that we use to put the drugs in. Like yeah. A little aluminum cap. Like a soda top or something. Yeah. No, could but it's, yeah. Could be a spoon. Could be a lot yeah. of could be, Yeah. Something you put it in. Well, and he put water in it, and I'm looking at him like, what are you doing? And so he said, no, no, this is the way I do it. And you're gonna have to do it like this because this is all we have. And I said, well, you have to do me, you have to do it for me because I don't know how to do none of that. And, and he started in my hands, and I instantly fell in love with it. Yeah, wow. Mm. And that was how many years ago? And that was six, six seven years. So, no. so you've been clean now for how long? Four years. Wow, we applaud you for that. Yeah. Same thing with you, Sam. Um, publicly, we want to both acknowledge you, that you guys are in recovery. Yes. You clean. You got tw like twenty years or so. I've been um, out and since '93. Wow, oh, true yeah. advocate for uh, mm -hmm. recovery. So we applaud mm -hmm. you guys for that. No, thank you. Now, all. now getting back to the progression of that, mm -hmm. because now here's a guy that he showed you how to do it, or he did you the first mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. From that point on, you start increasingly start using more. Yeah, well, there was a lot of guys. So, you know, once one guy is tired of taking care of you, you yeah. have to end up, you know, either getting another guy or another guy or end up, what happened to me was fend for myself. So I had to do a lot of things to take care of that drug habit. Yeah. You know, um, sell drugs, sell my body, uh, wow, set up, set people up, you know, a lot of things I did, you know, things that are always keep me <laughs> clean now, because I think about those things and I don't never want to do that, be there again, you know, it was, it hurt it and it was degrading, but, you know, so it's what I had to do because I was sick. When I was sick, I did whatever I had to do. What, to get well. what was it that was so interesting about heroin to you that you had to keep chasing it, as they say? Well, when you, once you do it, 
after like maybe four days, you're physically hooked on it. The opiate physically, you have to have it. You're gonna have the runs, you're gonna throw up, you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to stay still, you're, you're, and then you're gonna just go out there and find it. Yeah. However you can. It's like having the flu to the 10th power. Huh? Yeah, to the 10th yeah. power, <laughs> exactly. That's true. You know, so. it's amazing, when working in a detox um, many years and working in transitional and residential, it would always amaze me when folks would come into de detox, mm -hmm. that whole process of uh, unable to hold their bowels and spinning up and just aching, and, and it's a very painful uh, observation that you make mm -hmm. when you see people with going through withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people um, think it's, uh, it's it's something that you know. Oh, you could beat it. Yeah. No, it's not like that. Um, it's a thing that when I was shooting heroin, I had to shoot six bags, six bags of dope. Uh, half it was a six pack, so I can get out out of bed. Mm -hmm. Just to get out of bed. Wake up. Yeah, just to get up and start your day. Not my high. Not my whatever. Just to start my day, plan how I'm gonna get some more. Well, that's how one identifies the true addiction, and that is right. you're just doing it to stay normal, mm -hmm. right. so to speak, stay yeah. normal. Mm -hmm. So wake yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, to wake up and start your day, not even to get high anymore right. after no. a while. It's not even getting high. That was like you know taking my medicine. That was my medicine. That's so right. I, I take all the pain, the diarrhea, the mm -hmm. sweats. Uh, makes me think. You know, you gotta understand uh, a drug addict is really. Uh, it's not a dumb smart, person. Very smart. Person. They, they're intelligent enough to make <laughs> yeah. that kind of money every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've often said at, at, at the college here when people come into the program right. is that what you have to do is take those skills right. that you've learned to hustle right. on the street right. yeah. and convert them into uh, feeling bad and guilty right. about what you know right. is going yeah. on today and yeah. converting them into good counseling skills. And that's one of the reasons why they say sometimes that, you know recovering people make the best counselors because they have the experience yeah. of living the Well, oh, definite. Life. You know, I, I'm always saying that. What was it like, for example, uh, going through the experience that you went through before you found recovery? You got to remember back in the, uh, when I first started um, in the 60s, um, I was like, I was young. I ain't started, but my fam my uncles were drinks, uh, Jumpin' Jack, Tiger Rose. Um, yeah. I'm talking about old liquor yeah. back in the days, and cheap liquor. Yeah. We was poor people. Um, all we had was cheese, uh, the government cheese, the government milk. Um, so you grew up in the city, right? You were a city yeah. kid. Yeah. And so um, the only thing the escape we had was drinking Tiger Road, Jumping Jack, and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, when I started, um, I wanted to uh, hustle. Um, I should get a bag of weed and start selling nickel. Um, rolling, back in the days, a bag of weed for five hours, yeah. like <laughs> a quarter ounce, and you could yeah. roll nice, nice joints. And that's how I started in the corner selling loose joints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I like the game because it's good money coming in. Sure. Yeah. And then I start selling um, supers, pills. Uh, you remember those yeah. uh, trees, devil, uh, red right. devils. Um, Black Beauty. Yeah, Black Beauty. Yeah, Black yeah. Uh, that's Quay how Blues. I said Quelo and, and part of they were called those things because of the coloring. The Black Beauties were yeah. black tablet. Yeah. And, yeah. You know. Red de uh, and the Red Devils Christmas were trees Christmas and all trees. that. Yeah. Um, so at that time, um, we used to hang in parts and it was gangs and clubs and we used to have a good time. Um, I went to a party and my friend had a uh, crank. Crank is monster speed. Uh, methamphetamine, methamphetamine um, yeah. um, and I liked it because you could drink all you want and have sex all day long, you know, and I was all right with that. Yeah, yeah. You know we'll, I, mean? we'll I was all right with that. No question about so, yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, shit, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, just, just keep it real. So, you know, th at that time, everything was like, um, um, and then I think, to be honest with you, at that time, when they came out with that movie Superfly, yes, that's when every star since everybody wanted to be like Superfly. Superfly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Platform shoes, and I ended up buying some platform shoes and uh, my polyester <laughs> pants, bare bottoms, <laughs> my elastic shirts with a big collar, and you know, 
Afro, believe me, uh, uh, you know, the <laughs> whole nine yards. Uh, so I wanted to be a drug dealer. I, that was it. Well, it goes to show you how movies influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because when you, is. even going further, how Superfly yeah. transited, transitioned into that right. yeah. hustling, and yeah. then later we moved into uh, yeah. the other movie. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, it's true. Uh, Remember the trench connections at that time, and uh, the, uh, all that kind of stuff. But you gotta understand that um, in our neighborhoods, um, we poor, and so we needed, I uh, think that was an escape for us. I can't say it's an excuse, but it was escapes. Um, we was doing real bad. Um, and so by us having a little bit of money, uh, back in days, we should take care of our, our, our neighborhoods. What I mean by that, nobody would come down neighborhoods um, to mess with the old folks. Um, we always help the old folks out as far as providing protection, uh, food, mm -hmm. whatever they needed. Um, that was one thing about us. Um, you, they, they could sit down the steps and, and nobody will mess with them. Um, we won't let another gang come to our neighborhoods. We, well, we, not only were the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. they, were, they were territorial, there was no question right. about that, mm -hmm. but even the coloring of some of the bags and the drugs, it, yeah. they used to say this drug was bought outside our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you even had coloring, yeah. you know, like yeah. uh, uh, that would indicate uh, who's group is dealing mm -hmm. X, yeah. Y, or Z drug. Oh, yeah. Which would create problems because Definite. they're not buying the drugs in their neighborhood, right. therefore mm -hmm. they're not supporting. And then they would strategically sabotage those bags. Exactly. Yes, that's by right. By making what they call dummy bags. Dummy yeah. bags. Mm -hmm. You know, quinine and, and a whole lot of other crazy drugs and say, yeah. well, they're selling that. Mm -hmm. So folks would stop going to the place that was that's actually right. selling yeah. the good drug and mm -hmm. come to the other people who they kind of trust. Does that still go on today? I mean, I don't know. I mean, is yes. there still some of that happening where yes. there's still this territorial issue? Yeah. And there's still yes. Oh, yeah. There's yeah, there's territory. still a lot of that going on. So mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't know, obviously. Well, but like, yes, like you're saying, very important point because at that time, say, Indiana had uh, three wow. cokes, right? Three different kind of coke. It was, we had, we was running white tape. That was our, and they had red tape and they had black tape. Yeah. And this is how it used to be. Um, white tape was run like a knife in Somerset. Um, red tape, black tape, and red tape was selling down Indiana Avenue, different districts. Um, uh, so that's how it used to be. The heroin, uh, we could tell by the color of the bag or the stamp on it, who it belonged to. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm talking about when they, um, they say civilized, you know, we, because back in the days, if the police catch you, um, and you know you was a drug addict, they see trap marks on you, they'll beat the shit out of you. You know, they'll beat you up because you were a drug addict, you know? Mm -hmm. So we had to learn how to shoot drugs in the 70s, early 70s, yeah. in our legs. In our legs. Um, and in other private places too, people yeah. shoot. Yes, yeah, people yeah. shoot on their groins, yeah. um, you know, um, in the pits. So that stuff. doesn't show. It doesn't show. Yeah. And that's how it used to be back in. Uh, now people just, you know. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Does well, it make it? Does it make any sense to you? Yeah, it's a little. It's a little bit more um, different now. People don't care where they shoot at no more, and the oh. cops mm. are gonna beat you up anyway in our neighborhood. Oh. The cops don't help at all. They catch somebody hustling, and the person copping. Even a female is going to get hit by the cops. Wow. That's what they do. So um, that doesn't change. So they continue to hustle, and people continue to get high. Most of them, on Cousinton and Somerset, which is a real big oh, thing that. going on, that's like a little hell. That's like a little, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's like slowly dying there. They all look like zombies. You know, but down at Ken Kensington, Kensington, Somerset. Kensington and Somerset, but they're all humans. You know, the there, that was me. You know, I was there, I was standing there too, and I don't, I don't put, I don't walk by them and, you know, put my nose up. No, I go up to them and, you got, you guys are alright. I need, what you guys need? You know, what's going on? And in another way, people go get off on Somerset. Yo, what's popping? What's good? You know. Um, and they'll take that person, and that person, you know how to hit, you got this, you got that, you got the water, you got the works, come on, let's go. Yeah. And they'll take you. Yeah. 
and y'all go to the tracks or wherever they take you to, and you have to give them something for them taking you to where the good stuff is at, yeah. and then providing the services of the water and the works and all that. You give them a couple of CCs or two dollars or you know yeah. that's the trade. Now, how do people, since you've been clean and doing the advocacy work that you're doing, how do people view you now? View you now since you've been clean, women that you got high with, people you interacted with during your time of using. You gotta be a, a vision of hope when they see you. Yeah, a lot of them ask me like, um, I can't, um, I want to stop. Like, how can I stop? And I said, you have to really want to stop and when you do stop you need to get some help because it's in here yeah it's physical once the physical part's gone it's still in here yeah it's still mm -hmm. in your mind so that's the part that you gotta mm -hmm. the therapy that's the part that you need help with where the system has failed me a lot of times it, what do you mean by that of, i've been in and out of detoxes i used to go to the detoxes just to get myself clean to come back out to fill the heroin. So when you say the system failed you, maybe you, you're thinking that you just really couldn't equate to like why you couldn't no, stop using. No, because they didn't give me no aftercare. They wouldn't. No follow up. No follow up. It would just Which. detox me and send, you back send to me you. out on the street, you know? Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point because when I was at St. Luke's working in the, or the clinic there, there were always a group of people that would come in, clean up so that they can get a good high for exactly. the holiday. Mm -hmm. And that was a very uh, common experience. They'd come through the emergency room, we'd, we'd bring them into the hospital, they'd detox, but they were there really just to clean mm -hmm. up it's so that when they went out the in check, late November, that. Mm -hmm. they, that first hit again be like would be over. like they mm -hmm. started all over again and it's the holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, the, is there a difference between the population who use heroin and those who say would use cocaine or a difference between shooters and non-shooters? which, you know, most of the heroin addicts are you know, shooting. Mm. Would you say or not? To me, the guys hustling or the owners, the guys that don't use, people that shoot up, they kind of like think you're dirty. Oh. They're, they're dirty, you know, or wouldn't look at you like, oh, she's sexy, you know, that, you know, she, they put you in on dip a little bit. But then I'll turn around and six months later, that bull is using now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you used to put your nose up at me. What happened to you? Yeah. <laughs> huh? You were are, you, are you seeing a lot of younger people out there now? Now there's a lot of young people. Yeah, very mm. just, you know, it's not like before, you know, if you go out there now, like, um, they're very disrespectful. Yo, like if they give out samples. When they give out samples, everybody's running. For the to, samples. For the samples, you know? so. You'll see a little young boy, maybe 17, 16 years old, with two bundles in his hand about to give out some samples, but everybody's crowding him because they want to get the sample before it runs out, you know? So he'll scream, back the flip up, you know, everybody yeah. move away, get away, get away, away, and screaming, you know? And then they'll stop, they'll stop doing, giving out the samples if, if you don't listen to them. And they'll call you all kinds of names spit at you, push you, you know, everything. Wow. Like, well, they, they have that whole business down, you know, it's yeah. like running any business, so yeah. to speak, it sounds right. like, That's the catch. Right? That's the hook. Give a little out, yeah. and, and uh, the whole, oh, yeah. they'll come back and, and, exactly. and buy more, and probably what they're giving out is a little bit better than the stuff they're really giving you. I did when that. When you buy it. Mm -hmm. I did that. I gave out the best, you yes. know what yes. I mean? <laughs> and everybody said, hey, I don't care, because I'm going to make double with that stuff, you know, and I, next time I should sell my stuff, you know, it was good, but it wasn't the same thing as the same thing. You know what I mean? Maybe I step on it three times, and this one right. I step on it four times. Now, right. step on it for some means people. means cut. cut. Yeah, cut. cut. Different cuts. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it depends on uh, the quality of the heroin. It's a lot different than cocaine and heroin, yeah, um, weed and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> we got to look at the fact what was really um, the heroin <laughs> is more physical. Mm -hmm. Uh, it also attack you mentally too because it's something that you wake up with a high. You don't have, you need a high, you need a cure, you need something to take this pain off of you. Yeah, you need to your medicine. To take this, you know, and so you, you always got to think. You don't think about nothing else. Mm -hmm. You don't think about food. You don't speak about no responsibility. Um, so it's this thing that it's a constantly cycle 
of getting high. But when you reach the, you never gonna reach the same high when you first get high. You just reach another high, they say, oh, I got my high, you're not, nah, stuff like that. Right. And sometimes the high is just to get rid of the pain. Rid of the pain. After yeah. you've been on it for a long time. Yeah. 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 Now, a vicious cycle. Cocaine a vicious cycle. Is, a, is a cycle that in my last three, three minutes, five minutes, the rush or whatever it is, yeah. And you could have like um, ten, well, thousand dollars in your pocket before that night's over. The whole thousand dollars was spent. A heroin user would think I could take two hundred dollars out, get two hundred dollars for heroin, save the rest for tomorrow, and get high with this money. Mm -hmm. You see, but a cocaine person Don't doesn't. Don't think about tomorrow. You see, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. They buy. Now, what's happening now, too, you got to look at the fact um, people call it wets out in the street in our community. And you always see in the news now um, people killing people because uh, they were smoking wet. Yeah. That's another thing that's happening now. Wet is PCP. PCP yeah. um, uh, and it's our weed. So that's something really dangerous. Because anything that, if you take, I mean, I'm a dopamine. I love drugs. I love heroin. I think about it every day. Even now in recovery, you think about it. Even now in recovery, I, I think about it every day. I, I smell it. I could taste it. Okay. I could feel it going through my veins. All right. You know, it's a struggle for me every day. But you've been clean for quite a while. Yes. But I, the way I look at things, and I, I look at things simple, I just do one day at a time. Right. What do you do to combat that disease thinking? I tell people, um, it's something that you have to be sincere with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to know who you are. When I went to recovery, I was in a jail cell doing 20 years in prison. I was selling heroin, I was selling cocaine in prison. When I was shooting dope in my cell in Huntington Prison, my whole life just came out. I don't know what they call it. Yeah. I don't know what it is. But then you had an epiphany. But some something sort. told me, say, you doing the same bullshit you was doing yeah. outside. You in here and you doing 20 years in prison. And then my whole life just flashed. Yeah. So I took an inventory of myself. So I left the drugs in prison. I went to counseling, I went to therapy, I went to see psychiatrists, I went through everything. I want to know why I keep getting high. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, it's just, it's in you, but you just got to search and find out where you're at. So it, once you get to know who you are, and you work the steps, you work the program, whatever the program that works for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you believe God is this right here, I have no problem, as yeah. long as it's working for you. Um, I tell people when you come to prevention point and work, this is really serious. We tell them uh, because we're going to have people come in there with drugs. We're going to have people come in there with needles. Um, and we want them to feel strong. I mean, we want them to know what they're doing before they get into it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not too many people built to work yeah. in a, an environment sure. like that. What I mean by Bill is strong enough to, to be around that. Yeah. Well, I, I'll give you a simple example of that. It, when I show it's films awesome. in class yeah. that in which there might be someone showing you know, a heroin addiction, mm -hmm. students who are early in their recovery mm -hmm. have to walk out of the class sometime because it's so upsetting to them. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. so, um, um, so much of a problem that they have to leave the room in order to keep their sanity. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of interesting, you know. It is interesting. And you got to remember, Prevention Point, when it started, there was all drug addicts. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> For real. Right. That's yeah, how it, yeah. started, yeah. it started. Well, the whole drug field, when it first started, yeah. most of the people yeah. who were doing any kind of reasonable work right. were mm -hmm. just people who were in recovery. They were not right. necessarily people well-educated. Right. or anything. They were just people in recovery right. who maybe happened to have a degree. Right. If you remember, I, I remember the first job I had, they just said, how, how many years do you have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got hired right. on. Right. But you got, you know, everything was going towards that way. Because uh, cocaine was uh, for people who had money. That's what they call it, free base. When they came out with... Ready Rock. 
rocks, uh, cocaine. That's on everything. Because back in the days, you can get an ounce of how much of cocaine for about $900. $900. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm telling you, good cocaine, yeah. fish scale. You know, I used to sit back and snore, and I was like, I was, I thought I was in heaven. Yeah. It was real good cocaine. Both of you had mentioned snorting as a starting point, mm -hmm. that you can get addicted to a drug snorting it. I mean, yes. people, oh, yeah. people think, well, I'm not shooting heroin, so I'm okay, or I'm just taking a pill and, and I'm okay. Uh, but the reality of life is, is you can become seriously addicted and go through withdrawal and build tolerance, irrespective of how it gets into your body. Right. Again, you might not get as high putting it in through one part of your body as opposed to another, but you still, with the volume of use, will get addicted. Are you seeing more younger kids running down hell under the L, as they say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that, that a lot whole, of college mm -hmm. kids, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids from, um, I don't even know where they're coming from, up, 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 up. Above <laughs> with the rich people are at, come down, you know. Under the L. Come mm -hmm. right down to uh, Kensington and Somerset and see, find somebody mm -hmm. to help them because they ask around, you know, and when they see, and everybody's looking for someone because that's how they get yeah. their connections. Their, their fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how they get their fix is by helping somebody else find their way through the hood, how, yeah. to, how they get, how to get what's the best outside here right now. Yeah. What's mm -hmm. the best dope and what's the best coke right now? Any best escape route to get back from out of there. Yeah. Having mm -hmm. a connection. Oh, yeah. And, and I can imagine, that. like yeah. you say, kids come from the suburbs. Yeah, that's what I mean. College kids. Yeah. They connect with somebody who they can trust, mm -hmm. can take them to the best that's door, they they and trust. help them navigate getting out of that area quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I Some of them don't leave that quickly. Some of them stay, stay there. Around. Some of them die there. Some of them, yeah. They once, let me tell you something. Once you OD in the tracks, they're gonna go in your pockets and take whatever you got and leave you there. Yeah. Some well, of yeah, them call nine one one. Some of them don't. Yeah. I remember stories that before they would call nine one one, they would search them and get, no, take yeah, everything they, take they everything had. out your pocket first. So you know, in case whatever you, know, is, you got your money, your IDs it's theirs. and everything. But she she brought on a good point. Back then, sixties and seventies, that was the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Now, two thousand twelve, they still come down. Mm -hmm. to our neighborhoods. I mean, regardless, you know, what the political people do and everything. You can't uh, stop We it. always, a drug addict always going to find ways and means. Even though they move us from, from one block to another block, it's going to continue. And so, I, and you're right, uh, the best drug addicts, the best counselors, the best people, is to have people that is in recovery and understand yeah. people and relate to people. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who are not in recovery or couldn't help. I understand. No, I don't no, want to exclude definitely. a whole group of people who no, are working no, in the no. field. But the reality of life is is that that initial connection, and if you know anything about, right. you know, as we all know, counseling is that that first interview is very critical as to whether they ever come back and see you again. And, and we lose to. a significant amount of right. people after the first session. But you, especially dealing with the Latino population. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real difficult population to deal with. Right. It's hard to get 10 Latinos in a group to talk about the addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, um, our culture is different. Yeah. Uh, our way of, you know, everything about us is different. Number one, s some of us can't speak Spanish, I mean English. Yes. Uh, we, we have no kind of education. Um, our families abandon us because mm -hmm. our culture, if you are a drug addict, you out the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're gay, you out the family. Yeah. You know, they will s that's how our culture is. Point because the literature is just full of examples of the right. unique difference of Latino, Hispanic mm. uh, people and their experiences in America mm. and their experiences around their addiction. Um, can you highlight a little bit more of that? I mean, what, what, mm. what do you think is so different and unique about it? I mean, I know what the literature says, um, and, and, but uh, I assume some of the things overlap with you know the uh, you got the Anglo experience. So number to speak. one is the heroin Puerto Rico is a lot better than over here. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. That's a lot <laughs> point better. Well, that, point made. that's you a know, point, point made. made. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's nothing compared. You to know. You. And they I, I remember so in Puerto, too. yeah, in Puerto Rico, yeah. I with five hours, I shoot bag of dope. I was good to go. That was real good. 
You know oh. what I'm saying? Because that's how they saw the little corners, little corns, not wow. like bags over here. A uh, little plastic corner. In the corner of the bag. Yeah. So that's speak. that's uh, five out ten dollars. What you want? Because they just put it in there, tie it up, and here ten dollars. Um, because the climax in Puerto Rico is hot, and over here it's cold and hot. So the heroin they have to cut it so it won't uh, lose its protein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they use all kinds of chemicals just to make it horse uh, tranquilizer, tranquilizer. Yeah. whatever yeah. the situation will be. That's why you see our people uh, from Puerto Rico coming here. You see a whole bunch yeah. of jacks, uh, yeah. rashes all over them. Because if you mix, the heroin, yeah, yeah. If you mix it, come out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Imagine if you hook that kind of heroin, you come here in Philadelphia right. to look for services, and they give you a little bottle or something, whatever the situation they'll give you. You think that's gonna help you out? Yeah. Mm. I mean, you. I mean, understand that. Uh, detox is good, yes, aftercare is good, but it's just, I always say you got to meet where the person is at. If you're going to deal with a drug addict, when that person is really sincere for the help, the service are here. I always tell people, service is here, you just got to know where to get them, who or what. Sometimes you got to know who the person. But the Puerto Rican culture, um, or Latino culture, um, we are more like, we could say, we don't ask for help. And that's, that's true, mm -hmm. we don't. You know, we, we just do what we gotta do to survive. Mm -hmm. um, because we know we're doing wrong and our family put us out in the streets. So we kept, now we got more guilt. And so now we, we dealing with more stuff on top of us. So we get high more. Yeah. And then we hang with our, our own people because we could right. relate we could talk and understand each other. Mm -hmm. You know that old saying that like, I could look into your eyes, I could feel, you know, I know where you're at. So that's how we are. Yeah, and some yeah. of the services in the city yeah. have moved towards bringing on increasingly more uh, mm -hmm. Hispanic, Latino counselors mm -hmm. who are bilingual and can kind of relate Indeed. better. And I'm better. starting to see more uh, Latino people in mm -hmm. recovery as well. And, and that has to really kind of uh, exhibit to the Puerto Rican culture that there's a way out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm amazed um, that folks are really coming into recovery. And I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're not exposed to any outlets, mm -hmm. and if everybody's no, I, my line has always been doctors hang with doctors, lawyers hang with lawyers, people that use drugs hang with people that use drugs. Yeah. Right. right. The question comes to who you're hanging with. Right. So if I'm around people getting high all the time, that there's no, there's no glimmer, no sign of hope. Mm -hmm. So when you see the Latino and the mm -hmm. Spanish people coming into recovery, it's got to be a door opening for those that are still suffering mm -hmm. and oppressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, like other communities, I interestingly enough, we tend to see them as one uh, conglomerate of people. But within the Hispanic community, you know, we have the Cubans, we have the South America, we have the, you know, yeah, we have right. a variety of uh, almost uh, uh, groups of individuals who all identify with a cultural experience, but in reality, even within each other, have their own yeah. kind we, of... We, uh, I always say, you know, this is nothing about color, this is nothing right. about, co uh, it's not who you are, what. We're dealing with p drug addicts, right. any way you look okay. at it. Different neighborhoods, yes. One neighborhood might have, different community might have the gay population, the transgenders, the lesbians, the the wannabes and the gangsters, mm -hmm. and you know, they have all that. Right. So this is how it is now. So you have to have, I always tell you have to wear different hats. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't discriminate against nobody and everything. Um, when me working, and when I work in the community, it doesn't bother me I see people shooting dope. Because mm -hmm. I'm there with myself, I know where I'm at. It took yeah. me years and years to get where I'm at. I'm very comfortable. But I also learned to separate things between business and pleasure. You know what I mean, personal, mm -hmm. you know. So when I work, I work I'm a drug addict, ex-drug addict, recovery. I, I'm always a drug addict. That, that's the way I land, you know what I mean? My ex, my ghetto come out. You know, and, and if I say something wrong, I apologize. Um, when I go home, I'm a complete different person. I sit back, 
drink my coffee, unwind. You have to unwind. You just, you know, and mm -hmm. drink my coffee. I go down there and shoot, and people see that, when they see that you change, and they see that you don't. Because remember, back in the days, there's nobody coming around in neighborhoods and say, Derek, uh, you won't go to a program, man? <laughs> You're right. What is he going to say? Derek, let's go get, get paid, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got your shit with you, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You yeah. know, sh yeah. shit means your gun or whatever, and that was it, yeah. you know? And that's what opened my eyes, because when I was doing 20 years in prison, I said, damn, wait a minute, something wrong with the picture here. Because every time I come out, I still see the same jokers in the same corner. I'm the only one going to jail. Something wrong here with the picture. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? So when we deal with the Latino populations, we got to have patience. We have to have people that understand people. If you deal with the gay population, it's the same way, the lesbians and everything. The only, con, the only time we can come with a, a resolution in this here is getting people involved in our community. Um, we have to understand that stop complaining, complaining, stop uh, bitching, stop doing this. Not. You know what I mean? And yeah. just, all right, it's going to be there. George's going to be there any way you look at it. Yep. Yeah. It, it might go to a different district or wherever it is. Yeah. It's going to be there. That's a multi million dollar business. Yeah. I don't, a trillion. Right. Treat yeah. mm. And then, from your perspective, does this make sense? As a, yeah. A Hispanic okay. woman. Of course. It um, it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. They need a lot of help. Um, just right now, just people still living behind the tracks. They make little houses. Like they, they come here t in a program to go to a program. Uh, some way they didn't follow the rules. Now they're in the street and it's cold and they don't have a way back to get to Puerto Rico. So um, they start yeah. oh, okay. uh, pumping gas or, you know, yeah. and then they go right back, find the heroin, you know. It's right there. It's all right it's all there, there in the Badlands. It's right there, you know, and they need help. They need help. You know, and how, how did you, let me just, how did you find your recovery? I mean, I know you said it was about four years ago now. Yeah, so. well, my recovery was, um, I was raped. This guy tied me up and um, he had me for like two days. Well, finally, when he left, I followed him. And I was all bloodied up. I think I had like... Uh, wife beat her on and no shoes. Okay, he took everything off of me. But anyway, I followed him and I wasn't going to call the cops. Like I said, I don't really, they, they don't help me. So I followed him up the block and he was walking up towards Kensington and Somerset. And he was trying to hit the train and people were stopping. Are you okay? Are you okay? And I was just kept focusing on where he was going. Even though I couldn't see too much because my eyes, like, he he beat, he beat me up real bad. But I still could see a little bit. But he was not going to get away from me. Okay. Finally, I screamed before he had, because he turned around and seen me. And I said, can, can y'all get him? He robbed me. He robbed me. So the guys from across the street that are hustling grabbed him and brought him towards me. And why they had him gripped up. He was only 24 years old. Young boy. Um, took him up Roof Street, where there's hardly no no houses, Kensington and Roof Street, and um, took him to the side, and um, you know, I grabbed a brick and smashed his mouth, and all his teeth fell out. And he kept saying, Mommy, please, it wasn't me. And I said, that's exactly what I, I begged you to let okay. me go. And you didn't want to let me go. So you're going to get this beat down. Because until until I'm tired, so I did that, and then the guys beat him up too, and then I went in his pockets, and he had three hundred dollars. So I gave a couple of mm -hmm. money to the guys that helped me. Distributed the money. Yeah, to the guys that helped me, and um, put a hundred dollars in my pocket because now my face is messed up. I'm not gonna be able to make no money. So you had to go get her. You know, so I um, I kept a hundred. Yeah, I did what I did with the rest of the drugs that I did. And then I went to heaven and hope. 
which Heaven, is a, Heaven and Haven Hope. Of Hope. Yeah. Haven of Hope. Haven, Haven of, Hope. of Hope, which is a Christian um, woman center. Woman mm -hmm. center. Yeah, and the lady Rosa, she took me in like that, and um, that was the time that I, and my son came, and when my son sees me, you know, with my black eyes, he cried, and you know, just, just a tear came out, and I didn't want to hurt him no more, so that's when I started my recovery for me. Wow. From me inside and to get my family back. Yeah, you know, and, and I think it's that important that um, it takes a lot of courage to do what mm -hmm. you're doing and talk about that. But again, you you kind of display a level of hope for the women that are out there struggling right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. they got to listen to your story and know that there is a way out. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, both of you guys, again, I applaud you. Yeah. He's been a true advocate I know, I know in, in the Badlands, and um, you should be uh, honored to, to take on that role for many, many years watching you guys, and, and uh, mm -hmm. we applaud you for being here. Yeah. And, and, but you, you can know, see the pain, how, how, how much it, it hurts. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you almost have to, you know, we always talk about hitting rock bottom and then, you know, coming yeah. back up. and. God knows you went through the bottom with that yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. She went to the sub base. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of the bottom, so to speak. Yeah. And it's still very painful to, it is, to, it is. to you it know, is. reflect on, yeah. to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, when, when people come to the United States, or Puerto Ricans come here or wherever, they want a better life. Yeah. The United States, okay. Um, they come here to services, and when they send them to these places to get the service they need, um, first, they have to get a certificate, birth certificate, state ID, ID and everything. Okay, now I'm going to put you on welfare and all that. Okay, by doing all that stuff, the person's not getting treatment for the... Yeah. For the, for the problem. For yeah. the problem. Yeah. Um, I'm not knocking nobody. You know, it's nothing like that. Sure. Um, but the, the, everything needs to be changed. The system needs to... Like, I remember one time we started this program... We were snatching people straight out of the streets and taking them straight to detox. Exactly. You remember that? Yeah, I remember that. That, that. that was, I think we put like 30-some people in detox yeah. in one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Imagine. Oh, I can imagine. And somebody, yeah. when I was shooting dope in the neighborhood, somebody and someone grabbed me and said, Sam, I'm going to put you in detox. I said, where is that? Come on, let's go. I, don't, I said, come on. I'm, I'm going to grab some dope, put it in my pocket. <laughs> just in case you're lying to me. Because right. you know how it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's keep it real. But right. now, you know, I never had no kind of services. But you also I look at the fact some of the services take advantage, especially if you don't speak no English. Right. If you're not, they you don't understand the system. Let's put it that way. And most of the people that's been beaten down the system, beaten by the system, um, live in railroad tracks or live in old houses mm -hmm. or wherever the situation. And for them to trust another person, it's another difficult. program, it's going to take a lot. Well, you know, what's interesting about that, mm -hmm. here in Philadelphia, we are the leading mm -hmm. uh, yep. component mm -hmm. providing uh, levels of treatment mm -hmm. and recovery. Folks migrate here from right. all over the world Definitely. to come to Philadelphia mm -hmm. for recovery. Yes, right. So, and, and I think since the inception of Dr. Evans coming in and rolling yeah, and right. Sade and all the work that they're doing here in the city, mm -hmm. I, I think that something has to happen. They're opening up more doors for people going to detox. Mm -hmm. And I think it all boils down to, again, Sam, how willing people are mm -hmm. to, to get the treatment. This goes back to your statement, mm -hmm. putting people in detox and then putting them back to the streets. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. They want to meet people at whatever level. You yeah. might just want to go in detox. Yeah. You might want to go to a recovery house or a transitional house or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that whole thing has changed drastically from the time. Oh, I know. There's insurance companies are not playing that ball no more. Yeah. It's right. like it's one changed. detox a year. Well, under some of the, yeah, the original uh -huh. changes yeah. in managed care yeah. and all. But let me just kind of, we're coming to the end of this kind of discussion today. Okay. And I was wondering, did you, uh, I mean, I know things are going well for you now mm -hmm. you're in recovery for four years. Can you tell us maybe in a short little capsule of uh, what your future looks like? Where do you see yourself trying to go well, and where you are now? And maybe we yeah, can hear a little bit about how people can get in touch with yeah. well, prevention. I just want to get a little bit, uh, I guess, 
educated. I'm educated in street way, you know, but uh, I guess I need the um book part so I can um help other women out there and men out there that are still sick and suffering and tell them that they can recover. Now you do you did get your GED. You, yeah. you told me that a few years ago. And, uh, uh, and uh, we're uh, talking about maybe helping you get into one of the certified peer specialist programs right. to kind of get you started yeah. again. And because uh, uh, your story's uh, amazing. And not only is mm -hmm. it amazing, it's also uh, rewarding real. and real. And we need really more people like you okay. uh, saying hello to people and helping Definitely. them along. So yeah, yeah we, not only that, coming back here, you know, the counseling thing you want to do, help women, you yeah, come right back here to CCP. Mm -hmm. okay. right? Yeah, yeah. CCP is a good space for you. Yeah. All right. So, how would people uh, get the services? I mean, what? Well, like I'm saying, you know, um, Prevention Point is a, a unique program. Um, we have uh, walk ins um, every day um, from 12 to 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, sometimes no less than forty people come through there every oh. day. Wow! Wow! People not only drug addicts, but people ain't got no food. People ain't got no health insurance. Do not have no clothes. And then we got the drug addicts. We got the alcoholic. We had the mental health. And then we got the ones that are infected. So this is the population we deal with. Very um, different people come through there. Um, we have case managers, social workers, testers, we have computer class, uh, we have coffee, we got a day room, mm -hmm. they can sit back and mm -hmm. feel like um, home at least for a sure. couple hours. Get away from the cold. Yeah. Uh, okay. One six six. So what well, how would they get in touch? Phone? They yeah. can come down, we are located at 166 West Lehigh Avenue okay. in the lower level, Prevention Point. Jose Benitez is executive director. Mm -hmm. um, he's doing an excellent job there. Um, uh, as far as the computers, free computers. Sure. We have okay. instructors, the detox, the case managers, everything they need, everything's Good. service there. I have a little office there. I, I do volunteer. I help people out. I go in my community, and this is where we're at. Y'all welcome to come down there. Um, we, we are harm reduction, harm prevention program. We teach you and educate the community. We can never stop the drugs, but if we could protect somebody from not getting mm -hmm. infected again, mm -hmm. or take somebody out, one person, it's a chain reaction, like I always say, it helped the family. Sure. Well, I, so. I think, I, I think it, you know, you really do an excellent job. Mm -hmm. and yeah, what's your phone number? 215-634-5274. Yeah. <laughs> five, five, can you say that again? 215-634-5274. Uh -huh. Well, great. Well, that's all we have time for today. I want to thank my guests for uh, being with us today and thank you, the audience, for tuning in. You have been watching Tapestry of Life. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services at Community College of Philadelphia. For more information, please contact the college. Hopefully we'll see you for our next show.